Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Story Darlings podcast. I'm Sandra. And I'm Tara. And what have we got going on today, Tara? We are going to review the second part of A Court court of Thorns and Roses. Yes. So if you missed our episode last week, we talked about the very first half of A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Mass, which was the first 23 chapters or so. And... The second half of Thorns and Roses kicks off and there's so many things happening. And the last episode we left off, it was right after Cal and May and Tamlin and Feyre were kind of having this romantic dreamlike moment together. And then the second half wakes, she wakes up the morning after. And Tara, do you want to walk us through what that experience is like? Yes. So she encounters Faye that she's never seen before and soon discovers that she had been glamored a little bit. Um, So she had been glamored um, to not be able to see any of the Faye that weren't pertinent to her, right? So she can see Tamlin and Lucian, but she can't see like the background Faye. And I had secondhand embarrassment for her because... She was trying to sneak around and follow Lucian and listen in and eavesdrop. And the whole time, these other Fae have been able to see her and are probably sitting there cracking up like, what the hell is this human doing? So I had a little bit of secondhand embarrassment for her when she finds out that she was not as sneaky as she thought she was. Yes. Tara and I have been listening to like the full production audiobook for this novel as well. And it's so funny because Lucian, you can always hear him like laughing at her in the background and just like cracking jokes constantly. And suddenly it clicks into place like why he finds her just so hilarious all the time because of her little antics and not so sneakiness. But Tamlin is the one that put this glamour all over um, everything, whether it's objects, Faye, whatever, to protect her feeble little human mind from like Faye overload. But yeah, so funny. Secondhand embarrassment is the perfect way to put that so funny and then the second half of the book they've mentioned the blight before in the first half but the blight starts becoming a more like predominant thing it's spreading they don't really know what's causing it what's driving it and things are happening like these monsters crossing into the you know spring court there's a favor comes across a like a decapitated head that is mounted on the fountain at the front of the estate And so this kicks off Tamlin being sent away on very super secret missions and Lucian um, accompanying him sometimes and then reporting back to Feyre to give her peace of mind. So this part, it kind of reminded me of like, you know, the military wives who stay home and their husband has to go off. So she's kind of grappling with her romantic feelings for Tamlin while also hoping that he's safe and worried about his well-being. So anything else you want to add there? Well, Sandra says that we, the royal we here, don't know what the blight is. But as you'll learn, Feyre is again being kept in the dark about a lot of things that impact her life. And one of those is that blight. Um, So as you'll learn, like things are known about the blight. Feyre doesn't know about the blight and what it is and how it's all encompassing. So... Yes. It's interesting that you say Feyre being kept in the dark because, so if this is your first time tuning in, know that Tara and I hosted a read-along of the Throne and Glass series pre- previous to this. And so Selena in those books, the main protagonist, is very, very different from Feyre in Thorns and Roses because I, I don't know about you, but in reading Throne of Glass, you always felt like Selena was just a few steps ahead of everybody else and the reader, you know, you, the reader. And so you were the one being kept in the dark, not really knowing what was happening. And then Feyre is like a much different experience reading her point of view in this. You want to talk a little bit about like those differences? So Feyre, I get more of a like everyday person. Like she's like me, like, I don't really know what's going on in life, but let's just follow this trek and we'll see. Um, where Selena was very confident in herself, Feyre is not. She has been beaten down by her sisters, her family, her mom, everybody and their dog has, you know, played a part in lowering Feyre's like 
self-esteem and how she thinks of herself. Whereas Selena was very, very confident in herself and very confident in the fact that she knew what she was doing and when she would do it. And she made her plans and Feyre was just like, hmm, I'll go along with you. Like, okay. And so I feel like very connected to Feyre because she is throw me in this kind of a situation and I would be Feyre like, I don't know. I don't know about this. You're Where like, yes, like, I need your protection. Yes, <laughs> yes. And I kind of like you. Like, I, I could see myself falling for Tamlin, too. Like, he's very, like, much the gruff, like, protector. I could see that. So, Feyre is me. Would I want to be Selena? Yes. So, I'm really hoping that Feyre grows into a little bit more of herself and is able to trust herself a little bit more. Yes. Maybe this goes back to her being scared and the upbringing that she had and being forced into this place where she's the only human amongst all these, you know, old ass fae. But all of these things keep happening to her. And she always has like a very different kind of response than say Selena in Throne of Glass. <laughs> like Feyre is very emotional. And I was like talking to Tara a little bit about this earlier, but it didn't occur to me the first time I read this, but the second, or actually this is like my fourth time reading it, Thorns and Roses, but I'm like, Feyre cries so much. She cries over like every little thing. She's just like beside herself sobbing all the time, which I understand. Um, Tara put this, you know, the victimization mentality earlier. And I think that's spot on with who Feyre is. Yeah, she's been a victim her whole life, um, whether yeah. it be small things like her her sister just being mean to her or the big things like I still cannot get over the fact that the mom made her the caregiver of the whole family. But no matter what, she's been put in that situation where she can't be herself. But in one of Sandra's favorite things in ever, um, the holiday, yes, in ever, <laughs> the holidays... <laughs> Um, stay true in Sarah J. Mass's books. And we see the summer solstice come in. And we see it like kind of hit fair a little bit because she's like, Oh, I've been gone for like months. Hopefully my family's okay. And she's still like just like pining for this good outcome for her family. Um, but we see her kind of let loose a little bit in this scene, <laughs> a tiny bit. Um, and as Sandra has described it. She gets white girl wasted on some wine, which, I mean, Sandra, you were always wasted <laughs> off of half of a glass of wine. So, <laughs> oh my um, gosh. I'm not sure you can call it white girl wasted, but she drinks this wine, even though both Tamlin and Lucian are like, don't do this. This is going to hit you harder than you think it is. It hits her. It hits her very, very hard. And she is free. She, like, I envision her like a little nymph or a little like hippie, just like floating around, like dancing, like not having a care in the world. And we see Tamlin, who has mentioned that he plays music. And so he's over there. And again, in my mind, I'm envisioning like an Irish like pub and like the little Irish music people playing like their fiddles and stuff. And she's just like, I don't know, dancing her Irish jig. Um, <laughs> and so she is dancing all night and I don't know she's just finally having some fun I think yes if anyone knows how to party it is the immortal fae this summer solstice this little soiree in the woods was one of my favorite scenes in the entire book just because I'm all about the celebrations and stuff it's like when Tara was describing me okay I'm not an alcoholic okay like I am very sensitive to alcoholic though. My body doesn't process it well. So the fairy wine in this book reminded me of like, you know, Sandra drinking Boone's Farm back in college where I have a bottle and I'm like, woo, let's go do all the fun things. And Feyre at this party is just like that because she's been suppressed and just, you know, ground down her entire life having to take care of all this serious stuff. And so this is basically the first time away from home. It's almost like, you know, when students go off to college and they just kind of, they're still innocent and naive, but they just go out and do all the things and have fun. And so that's kind of Farah at the summer solstice party. So Tamlin, if you guys are not familiar with David Garrett, who is a German violinist, 
please go look him up on YouTube. He does like modern renditions of rock songs and stuff. Hot blonde guy, long hair, playing on a playing a mean violin. And so that's. I'm gonna have to look him up right now. (laughs) David Garrett. The first time I read this, I think it was like four years ago. That's who Tamlin is in my head to me. So that's who I see. And so there's a scene where Tamlin, you know, with his mask on, is just like really going at this fiddle. People are dancing suggestively. Farah is barefoot, I think, and she's just having fun dancing with everybody, letting loose, letting her hair out, so to speak. And that's kind of like what I have in my mind. But one of the funny things happening this whole time is Tamlin asks Lucian to babysit Farah the whole time. And she's just not listening to him at all. And she's just kind of like, you know, as as Tara said, white girl wasted. She's like, I don't need a keeper. (laughs) Just doing whatever she wants. And it's it's so hilarious, so entertaining. And then um, Tamlin excuses Lucian and Lucian's free to go off and chase tail how he's been wanting to all night and the Tam Tam was just like dance (laughs) Farah and and she does (laughs) Sandra does like when when he orders her around yes I I don't know why I just I like that um Tara kind of likes these gruff little overbearing little moments too and I'm, I'm kind of all about that like the whole beauty and the beast Mm -hmm. parallel with this you definitely see it and you see it a lot in his behaviors and his reactions to things like claws coming out and just being so rough all the time like he's just so Mm -hmm. like riled up and angry and definitely get that vibe a little a little bitey a little slashy (laughs) a little bitey (laughs) a little bitey um uh that's fine Um, You want to talk about what happens after the summer solstice party? It's like the after after party. (laughs) It's just a little romantic moment, really. It's not like anything. It's just the two of them in the forest with the will o' the wisps. They're seeing like these little. (laughs) The oh, I did write little wisps, but that's all I wrote in my notes. Yes, (laughs) the little (laughs) wisps. It's not super helpful. It's like these little will-o'-wisp creatures like kind of floating through the forest. So they're like these little, I I picture them as little fireflies or something. So just little romantic things glowing in the dark. And Tamlin and Feyre are sitting by the reflecting pool and the stars are in the sky. And they're just seeing all of these like, like beautiful things happening in the night sky. And I think it's early morning, actually. It's like turning to dawn. And it was just a scene between the two of them where they kind of acknowledge and accept their romantic feelings for one another is more than just a forced you're gonna live with me because of this treaty type of thing like and then they wake up the next day I do have to admit that through all of his gruffness and everything Tamlin is romantic like Uh the little Glenn so he took her to in the first half and then now that little wisp area like yeah I I feel like if you are the high lord of the spring court and you're all about like flowers and rainbows and butterflies you're gonna have a little romantic streak in you too and I think like what we find out about his upbringing with his father and his brothers and stuff too like he kind of was in this place where he branched out and just did his own thing and separated himself. So he's very different from the rest of his family too. So I don't know. He is a romantic though. I would agree with that. So the next morning they are enjoying themselves some breakfast. And I think this is the part where it is mentioned that after she like kind of made fun of how far away he was, that they have never sat in that table again. So it's always been a close breakfast. And I think that's kind of cute too. Like he took her, not her like, dig but like her dig um and fixed it so they're they're the three of them are having breakfast and then all of a sudden it gets very serious and lucian and tamlin are like oh okay you need to like you need to go over here and tamlin puts a glamour on the person who shows up which is resand 
And so Rhysand like kind of saunters in there and he's talking to them. And, and it's mentioned that he is the core of Amarantha, um, which does not sound like a compliment in any way um, for Rhysand. And we hear that the Night Court is the only one not affected by the Blight. And then we also see um, just like the hatred that has formed between Tamlin and Rhysand. And um, we also find out that Rhysand is the High Lord of the Night Court. Or the, yeah, the High Lord of the Night Court. Whew, that's a sentence. And he is also the one that saved Feyre that first party night from the the three Fey that were like trying to sexually abuse her, right? And so um, we see this, and then as Rhysand is about to leave, he notices that there's a third chair, third like breakfast plate, and he's like, "Hey, where's your guest?" And Tam was like, "Oh, I sent them off when I felt you like coming in." And Rhysian, like, stands there and, like, sniffs or something. Like, he felt, like, a presence, right? And so he looks directly at Feyre and the glamour breaks. And I think part of that is he knew Feyre before. Like, he he recognized her scent slash felt her, you know? And so he's like, hmm, I think you're lying to me. (laughs) And so he calls him out. And I think even he mentions that he knows her and that... I think he like hints at the like the curse or something that she might have been the one to break it or something. Yeah. I don't know if that happens right now, but you can tell he's powerful. Uh-huh. There's a, there's a moment where he, Feyre describes it as Rizan's claws scraping against her mind. And he has the sort of power that can shatter someone's mind and make them go nuts. And just, he could kill them if he wanted. He is very powerful. Tamlin and Lucian obviously respond to that. I can't remember why he has them bow. Is it because he was um, threatening Feyre? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Because he is the whore of Amarantha. This is, the, yes. this is the thing that he hints at. Because he is the whore of Amarantha, like, they ask him not to tell her about Feyre. And he's like, oh, but, like, I am the whore of Amarantha. Like, that's not very whore-like. And, and um, so he's like, but I'll do it if you bow to me. And so Lucian and Tamlin both bow, and he even makes them put their head, like, on the ground to, like, show that he is, he is in the power by keeping the secret. And so... Feyre notices that A, he's powerful, and that B, Lucian and Tamlin are willing to do that to keep her safe. Yes. She also does another key thing here, which when Rizand asks for her name, she gives a false name. But instead of making up a name, she gives him Claire Better. And we will circle back on that later. Yes. Um... (laughs) After that visit, Tamlin is like, oh, you gotta, you gotta go. Like, you gotta go back home. Like, the blight's getting worse. You, you gotta leave. And so he kind of sends her off back to her home. And she's like, wait, like, we just started getting together. Tamlin had just told her that he loved her and she didn't say it back. And this is like, I, I think his way of protecting her from everything that's about to happen. But he sends her home. She gets home and her family is now fabulously wealthy back to their like original wealth. And she's like, oh, he really did do it. And he did it good. Like he he brought back all of their ships. He, you know, just made them back to the wealth that they had previously done. However, Nesta still remembers what happened. And Nesta has went looking for her and is a little bit mad that she is now showing back up perfectly okay. And she's like, wait, no, like what, what really happened? Because you were taken to Fey Kingdom, like what happened? And um, she also hears that something happened to Claire and her family. All of Claire's family is now dead and Claire is missing. So much happens in this scene. A, 
you get some respect for Tamlin because he honestly loves Feyre, cares about her so much. Rizan visiting like that and just even the slightest chance of Feyre getting back to Amarantha has Tamlin terrified. So his only move is to send her away. But in the months and months and months that she's been gone, when she comes back and is taken to this estate that is not their one little bedroom hovel or cabin, and she sees that, you know, Elaine's planning like a welcome back ball and stuff. And Nesta, like to her surprise, anybody's surprise, was the only one that actually questioned everything. I think Thera talks about Nesta's iron will, like very impervious, like nothing. Um, just because she's such a very cynical person, like she will not fall for even Fey antics like that. And so it was a very touching moment for Thera to know that her oldest sister went into the woods by herself whenever she barely chops wood or did in the first place and risk that. And then Nesta basically found out that everything was a lie, but Nesta still kept that a secret. Like she didn't bother telling Elaine or the father, like, why do that? Like why burden mm-hmm. them with that? But she knows. And so they do have like um, some bonding moments. Like Feyre is teaching Nesta to paint at one point and it doesn't go well because Nesta is not that person, but they just like, they work on the relationship that Feyre craved and wanted all along, you know, whenever she had Mm -hmm. to take on the mother and father role. And it's just so sweet. And then they talk a little bit, they have a heart to heart about like Tamlin even. Right. Yes. And they have a heart to heart about Thomas. Yes. Because Feyre notices right away that Nessa did not marry Thomas. And she's like, but why? And Nessa's like, well, he would not have come with me to save you. And she knew that. And that was like, I guess her deal breaker. She was fine with like him possibly beating her and whatever for the wealth. But she knew that he would not sacrifice himself for her family. And I know, so, it kind of, it gives yes. you like really good feels for Nesta like she gets some of that respect back um, Mm -hmm. makes you like her as a character it does make you wonder how much she would have held to those morals had she not already gotten her wealth back though yes she had a lot of resentment and bitterness before from not having that that wealth yeah like Mm -hmm. had had Tamla not given them their wealth back would she have still not married Thomas for not going after her yeah or would she, would the wealth have won out for her? Or the, like, I guess he wasn't really wealthy, but the, the money. I mean, in a lot of ways, this trip, this forced trip back home is closure for Feyre because she's spent every night of the past several, several months wondering about the state of her family. And so we get Feyre walking back through the town. She runs into Isaac and his wife at one point, and she can tell that he's like grown into a man now. And they just have this little passing moment. She sees Thomas just being Thomas in in the town, and so she sees Claire's burned down house too. Like they like just raised it to the ground, and this trip is very much closure for her. So yeah. she sees that everything is as it should be. And then she has that heart to heart with Nesta and is like, I love him. And Nesta is just like encouraging her to go back, right? And 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 fight for it. And what happens then? Feyre goes back. Yeah. Feyre leaves her family again. And she heads back. Um, and we we get a little bit of knowledge as she comes back because shit has happened in the castle or the like whatever. Um, she was living in I don't know if they called it the castle but I'm envisioning a castle because there's blood everywhere there's clearly been something happened Tamlin and Lucian are gone and she ends up running into Alice and Alice fills her in a little bit about what happened and basically Amarantha came and she took Lucian and she took Tamlin and she killed all the lesser people that got in her way basically And Alice tells her a little bit about Amarantha, which is that she is the high queen of Perinthia. And um, the way she got that is she was battling with the king of Highburn or Kyburn or however you say that. King Um, of Highburn. Yeah. Yeah. 
and she was an emissary for him to Corinthia. And she ended up kind of tricking all of the high lords into being under her power and taking their power away from them. And so they're all somewhat slaves to her, but she really likes Tamlin like really likes him. And there's a connection between her and his family who are now dead, obviously. And so she wants Tamlin to be her, I guess, husband, something like lover. I don't know if she wants to At least to go a lover. Far. She's least obsessed lover. with him. Yeah. She is obsessed with him. And so she is the one who put the curse on him, which is not a blight. We find out it is not a blight. He's been kind of lying to read the whole time it was a curse put on him by amarantha basically he has to get a human to fall in love with him and admit that they're in love with him and it can't just be any human it has to be a human that had hate in their heart for Faye and had shown that hate by killing one like not in battle basically like, yeah killing one of his like court a, it had to have been unprovoked attack and no. killed one. So basically, Feyre fit that because she unprovoked uh, attacked Andrus and killed him. And we hear that Tamlin had been sending his people over the wall into the human world to see if he could get somebody to attack them and kill them so that he could then break this curse. And he was running out of men. Um, and Andrus was one of the last and he finally got Pharaoh. So much is told in Alice's history lesson. And this adder creature that we were introduced to kind of in Pharaoh listening in, we learned that the adder is the henchman of this mm -hmm. mysterious female who is Amarantha. And she's kind of a force to be reckoned with. Like she's the only one on this continent or in this world that is on level with the king of Hybern. She was actually like his general in the war. And so she placed this 49-year curse on Tamlin because he kept rejecting her and wouldn't like come to her bed and be her lover. And so I think Alice explained that she held like a masquerade ball. And basically, I think only the spring court was told that it was like you know, to wear masks and stuff. So they show up to this under the mountain masquerade and that's when she springs this curse on them. And it's at this masquerade where she also took Lucian's eye and like scarred his face really bad too. And so all of this nasty stuff happened. And then we learned that she has a reason for being this hateful and evil. Like she had a sister that was very dear to her but her sister basically scorned her and picked a human man over, you know, her respect and love for Amarantha. Her sister's name was Clithia. And so we learn that Amarantha just has like a really complex relationship. And that's why she just has so much hatred for them. And the thing with Clithia, her sister and Jurian is Jurian <laughs> ended up cheating on Clithia. Like he had a very shallow fickle heart and ended up betraying her in turn so Amarantha just has a lot of hatred and scorn all around in her heart. And the fact that Tamlin is rejecting her, she does not take kindly to that. So Feyre comes back and hears all of this from Alice, sees the manor completely destroyed. It reminds me, like we were talking in the first episode about Beauty and the Beast and stuff mm -hmm. and how Beast gets mad and things just happen and the manor is just completely destroyed. I just like kept picturing that in my head. And so... Alice calls her an idiot basically, but for doing this, but Feyre decides to go on a little rescue mission under the mountain. Well, and first she calls her an idiot because she could have broke the spell. Like everybody knew she loved him, but she was so stubborn that she wouldn't tell him that she loved him. And she could have broke the spell because it was within that 49 years. So Amarantha, like the 49 years has just ran out. That's why she came and took him back away. It's because he just ran out of time. Mm -hmm. And they're all like, you could have done something to stop this because you love him. All you had to do was just say it. Like, that's it. Just say it. <laughs> and so Alice is a bit mad at her too. And then we also hear that there's a part of the curse that we still don't know. Like nobody knows. 
Yes, because Alice physically cannot talk about it. Like yes. she is cursed against a, talking. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's still a part of the curse that Amarantha doesn't want anybody to know, and so she can't. She can't tell Pharaoh. And so, yes, Feyre goes on this rescue mission into the mountain and she meets Amarantha and she's like, okay, well, if you can pass my three challenges, I'll let you have him. We'll, or we'll answer just, a riddle. We'll mm-hmm. just say that the, the, I'll break the curse. She doesn't say when though, and that will be important. But with the riddle, she says, if you answer my riddle, I will break it immediately. And so that was the key part right there. Like she kept... And Feyre caught on. She's like, why did she say immediately there? But she didn't catch on that she never set a time with the first part. So, like, that's that's something that will come up later. And the riddle was not that hard to get. Like, did you get it the first time you read it? Yeah. Like, I got it right away. Yes. So I was like, oh, this is not, like, I could, I could tell you what that answer is right away. And I, I even wrote it down. But we get it right away, right? But it's like, imagine being at the court of this evil woman surrounded by all these creatures under a mountain and you're scared and you're like worried for your lover right there. It's like, I have been in job interviews where they ask me a simple question and I'm like, oh, idea, thought just goes out of my brain and then I'm a blubbering dumbass. <laughs> so I'm <Yes>. like- <laughs> Or I was picturing like, okay, you're watching a game show on the TV and you're like, oh, I'm so smart. I know all of these answers. But then like, you know, when you get there and you're like, uh. Yeah. I can't remember. plus B plus C? Yeah. I can't remember if Amarantha was like, oh, if you guess wrong, something bad is going to happen. Like, I don't remember if there was a condition like that. I think I'd have to go back. Yeah, I can't remember. But anyways, we got it reading. But yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, it was it was fairly easy for me to get reading it, especially knowing what is driving Amarantha this whole mm-hmm. time. Like you're like, mm, mm-hmm, yeah. Um, but anyway, so she goes on to her first task, and Amarantha's like, "Well, you like hunting so much. Let's let you hunt." And this big <laughs> at, this scene like grossed me out so much. <laughs> So the arena has like all of the fae. So again, like imagine gladiator times, like all of these fae are sitting around cheering slash whatevering. And she is in this little arena and the chick is like, okay, you're going to hunt. And then like all of a sudden things start falling and this giant worm comes out and E. <laughs> the midden guard mm-hmm. and, and it's like a muddy labyrinth right mm-hmm. with bones so again i'm picturing like the coliseum where they have the labyrinth underneath and stuff and yeah but mm-hmm. anyway so she falls into this one little like area of this labyrinth and she's like ew what is under me like this feels weird but like i know this feeling and it's bones. And then she feels like a skull. And she's like, uh, I need to get out of here. Um, and so she starts trying to figure out a way out. And she's like, oh, I can make steps out of these bones. And like starts jabbing them in the side of this like hole thing. And um, then she's like, wait a minute. Like, I'm going to be hunted if I get out of here. I might as well like hunt the thing hunting me. And so she starts jabbing, like breaking the bones. And jabbing them into the ground and making like a lances all at the bottom of the the pit. And then she goes out and she's like trying to find the worm. And Lucian helps her. He's like, it's over there. Um, Which he gets into trouble for. But anyway, he helps her. And she finally gets the worm chasing her. And she's using her little bones to like make her run faster and things. And she lures it into the pit where it falls to its death. And Amarantha's like fuck you, you're just a human, you weren't supposed to survive this. Yeah, Worm gets nasty impaled, and I think Feyre's arm gets pretty mangled as well, Mm -hmm. like the left arm or something. It gets broken, and like the bone is sticking out, and they just put her back in this dank cell of a prison, and it gets infected. And she has help from two people. Well, she has help from Resand. Also, though, so when she won this 
contest. Like, not only is, like, you know, Lucian's going to be in trouble for shouting out and helping. Like, thank God the worm was blind um, because that helped, you know, be in her favor as well. But then Amarantha can't just be, like, happy with Feyre winning. She has to rub it in, like, oh, well, every they were placing bets on the outcome of the the challenge Mm -hmm. as well. She's like, oh, well, so many people just lost money in this court and only one person bet that you're going to win. And we kind of find out indirectly in the next scene when she's, her arm is infected. Like if it's not fixed, she is going to die. And so enter Rizand. She's got a fever already. So it's already like to the point that it's, it's going downhill fast for her. This is a time that frustrated me about Rizan's character because he was holding something over her head in order to like save her life and so that was the time that I was like very pissed off at him yeah you, you want to talk about it you you don't get a very good um picture of Rizan in the beginning here because no. he's the one who left the like skull on the spike out in front earlier in He's, he's Amarantha's whore, so that doesn't make him, like, look very good because she's evil incarnate, right? And it's kind of like in Throne of Glass with Maeve and, um, what's his name? It's very similar to Lucian. I'm the having a hard time. boyfriend. Oh, Lorcan. Lorcan. I was like, it's so similar. I cannot think of anything I about Lucian. Lorcan. Mm-hmm. Um, but you get the same sense off of him when he picks Maeve, you know? And? And, and I'm like, please don't. Please do not pick this Amarantha chick. Like, she's evil. Yes. But. Rezand also, so coming full circle on the name that Feyre gave him, Claire Better, when she arrived at Amar- Amarantha's seat under the mountain, she sees Claire's body. Like, isn't it naked and been tortured? Mm-hmm. And it's just like. Been tortured. Hanging there on the wall. And yes. she's just like feeling beside herself just so much grief and and shame and sadness. For her per- part. So Rhysand comes and yes, he's holding over her head that he will help her if she agrees to spend two weeks out of every month with him. And she's like, I don't want to spend any time with you. Like, none. <laughs> um, and he's like, well, then you'll die. And she's like, but Lorcan will come help me. Or not Lorcan. <laughs> Lucian. <laughs> Lucian will come help me. And he's like, uh, are you sure about that? Like, like when? When is he going to come help you? Because you might be dead. Mm -hmm. As we've seen before, like Lucian sometimes does not come to her rescue or is delayed, Mm -hmm. whatever, like the Naga in the forest. Mm -hmm. Well, and he he doesn't fully understand her limitations, I think, in being human. Like he doesn't full like or she doesn't know if he fully understands them. Like she's like, okay, well, will he come in time? Because I'm dying currently. Um, And so she ends up like bartering with. Resand and it's like okay how about five days five days every month I'll, I'll come and he's like how about 10 and she's like how about a week and so they agree on a week and he ends up healing her but he also puts a little tattoo on her to like mark that they have a deal right and he's doing this to piss off Taylor <laughs> like that is the reason and he makes it abundantly clear why he did that and it's like this little eye, like in the palm of her hand, there's like an open eye, which yeah. is really creepy to mm-hmm. me. But anyway, um, so he does that. And then she is sent about her way. And as part of earning her keep during these trials, she has to do chores. And so the guards are all um, being very mean to her and making her do chores that are like never ending. Like, impossible she yeah she is cleaning the floor with this bucket and like the water just keeps getting muddier and muddier like it like it is like there's some sort of magic over it that she is never going to get this floor clean and the lady of the autumn court comes by and she makes the water clean for her and lets her get the chores done and um she's like this is for saving my son for giving your name so that he didn't die. Because when Amarantha asked for Feyre's name, nobody was willing to give it. Feyre wouldn't give it. And then she turned to Lucian and she's like, okay, well, if you don't give it, I'm killing Lucian. And Feyre's like, no, stop. My name is Feyre. Yeah. And so she gave her name to save Lucian. 
And so the the lady of the autumn court came by and helped her out so that she wouldn't have to continue because she wasn't allowed to leave until the floors got clean. Yeah. I think she was going to be punished or something if, if she didn't get it clean. So Lucian's mama coming in with the life debt and paying that off. Um, and then there's a second chore, like a second chore, which is like digging. <laughs> she, she goes into a dark bedroom and it's like ashes in a fireplace and is expected to dig out all these lentils that are in there. <laughs> and they keep coming back. Like they're again, <laughs> magic to where they, they will never go away. And they're like, you better get these done before the owner of this room comes in because he will skin you alive. And then in comes walking Reesan. And he's like, what the fuck are you doing in my room? <laughs> she's like she's covered like, in soot. <laughs> she's like, I'm being made to do this. Like, what? And and so they have a little bit of a, like a talk. And he ends up glamoring the um, guards to never make her do a chore again. Which is, or, or if they do, they have to stab themselves in the stomach. Yes. And you know he'll make them do it too. I mean, even when he was visiting Farah in the cell, like he twit, do you remember him twisting her elbow, the bone, like hurting her? Yeah, like, he's a little bit sadistic. He is, yes. Like he, he will do it. Oh, hold on, Sandra. You said that like you were excited about him being sadistic. <laughs> You're like, no. he is. Like, mm-hmm, that does it for me. <laughs> Thanks, Tara. I'm like, I'm so, I'm blushing now. Hopefully no one sees this. <laughs> oh, anyway, anyway. Well, I have to give it back to you because you you tend to give me the like hard time about being I do. Like... This, is, this is fair. <laughs> um, so, so then she is sent to her second task. And my notes are not helpful in this, so I have to remember what the second task is because I just wrote second. Well, the second task is um, it's kind of payback for Lucian helping Feyre in the worm challenge. And it's also after Amaranth is like, I, you know, I asked some questions about you to learn even more about you. And so the challenge is to uh, read these questions and to pull the right lever as the answer while a wall or a ceiling of like spikes are coming down on her and Lucian. <laughs> yes. And like, I know that this was an intense scene, Tara, but you have Feyre who is illiterate and she is like trying to sound out like hating herself for not knowing how to read. And you have like paragraphs of the book where she's just like, grass grasshopper and she's like trying trying to read it and meanwhile you have lucian who's tied up like across the area and he's just like pick one farah he's like getting really desperate and so she's like over here like okay well i can't read like that's not helping so i'm just gonna pick the one i think and she's like, well, one's a bad number because you don't want to be alone. And two is a couple, so that's good. And three is like too many people. And so she's like, I'm going to go pick two. And so Resand is like, okay, dumb, dumb. No, don't pick two. And so like she goes to pick it and it's hot. And she can hear Resand in her mind. And he's like, not that one. And then she goes to pick one and it's hot too. And she's like, okay, not that one. And so then she goes to three and like it's not hot it's just she's like okay and so she she ends up saving lucian but with the help of Re- resand and so she's like oh great now i owe this motherfucker more uh, because he saved me again but it shows resand's power because he's able to get into her mind and be like nope not that one nope not that one yeah Rezan's power even though it's muted by amarantha you just like there's so many things that he can do he can mind control people he can glamour people like mo- way more than tamlin or any of the other courts can there's just so much so many things that he can do it's throughout this he starts taking her at he starts taking fair as his own little harlot to these parties that Amarantha is hosting under the mountain. And so Feyre doesn't have a choice in this matter. She's been kept in a cell. So every night it's like she's bathed, dressed in like a skimpy little long loincloth type of outfit with her tattoo, you know, showing. 
And then he's just like, drink this fairy wine. Like it'll get you through the night basically. And it's night after night of what happens to her. Well, and he's painted her. Yes. That if any paint is missing, like he knows somebody else has touched her. Mm -hmm. Which is. What are your thoughts on that? (laughs) Very creepy. Well, possessive. Mm-hmm. A little possessive, which Tara's I mean, like, can oh, be, yeah. It can be good, <laughs> but like he doesn't have a right to be possessive of her, which is what's going on in her mind. She's like, yeah, I'm not she's, with you. Like, the I the whole point I'm days, here, motherfucker. Yeah. Like the whole point she's here is to rescue her boyfriend. That is the only yeah. reason why she's here. Yeah. And so, like, it's it's kind of creepy a little bit in that sense that she's not there for him, but he's still laying some claim. And again, it's all to piss Tamlin off. And he's very open about that. And so that makes her like hate it even more because she knows she's being used. And so, and he's also plying her with this alcohol that she doesn't remember anything that she does like at all. And so the first night she asks Lucian when he comes to visit her, like what she did, like what happened? And he's like, well, when you weren't dancing, you were sitting on his lap. And she's like, oh, okay great um and so yes she is being like paraded around she is the entertainment Mm -hmm. yes which we do find out some of this backstory and tension Mm -hmm. behind tamlin and rezand so it was when she was cleaning up stuff first off she finds out that rezand has kind of an animal form too he shows her his wings that he keeps the secret and hidden from everyone and they're, they're like these giant bat-like wings. And you can see like the veins and they're a little bit translucent, you know. And he has like little... Again, talons. look up Thomas Ellis from Lucifer. Well, there's a term for that. Oh, I should get a term. <laughs> Devil bunnies. Oh, no, Lucy fans. Can you please? Oh, no. <laughs> that is resand to me with his like wings and... <laughs> Tara loves her some Lucifer. She will probably mention it in like every episode and yes. she has before. <laughs> yes. I love Lucifer. I love the snarkiness of him. And like, again, Resand is snarky and he's like very set in his ways. And he is all about pissing somebody else off, which is Lucifer. So, yeah. But we learned that Resand's father, right, killed Tamlin's father and his brother's. Yeah, mm-hmm. they butchered his family. So yes, Which is I why think Amarantha doesn't like him. She is forcing him to be her lover just because she knows he can't stand it. There's that one scene where Rezan comes into the cell and he's just like, she's running me ragged. Do you remember that line he said? And I'm like, what is going on? I don't want to picture what she has been having him do. And he's just like beside himself, tired. He hates it. Too. Yeah. Um, and then we find out a little bit more about Tamlin because we know that Resand is very powerful. And so Favor's like, well, is is are all the High Lords the same kind of powerful? And he's like, No, Tamlin is super powerful. Like, I forgot the way he worded it, but he he basically said he can kill Amarantha at his powerful, like that he's that level of powerful. And so we find out that he is doing all of these things, making all of these like scenes with Feyre to piss Tamlin off. That way, when she does win, he is so mad that he just takes her down. You get some Hulk vibes, right? Yes. Like I said, he's doing this all and he's been very open about that. But now we see like behind that and it's not just to torture Tamlin it's to put Tamlin in the right set of mind when he does get released that he is the beast yes that's what he says I still think he finds a sick joy in getting under oh well yeah he does that too but the last party the last party that they have and it's before Feyre has drank any wine and been you know summoned by Rezand and she finally catches Tanlan's eye because she's been trying to catch his eye this entire time. And he's just like been so stoic and neutral and like not, you know, looking at her, paying attention to her. And they finally like catch each other's eyes. And Tam is like, you know, like, follow me over. Oh, yeah. Like, let's go. 
And it is like this little hot, sexy session, like super fast. She like sneaks away, follows him in. He immediately just like crushes her against the wall. And then they're just like teeth and nails and making out and they are getting hot and heavy really fast. Yes. And then Resand walks in. Yes, as he does. He just clears and, his throat. And he's like, um, break it up, you two. <laughs> and Tamlin has to leave because I think he got called away or whatever. And Resand is in there with her and she's mad as hell at him because he the interrupted paint. the, the one yeah. time. And her paint is messed up. And all of a sudden, Resand like starts making out with her and touching her and stuff. And then in walks Amarantha and she's like, oh, hi. Like, and Tamlin. See? He's Tamlin's behind yes. her. And she's like, see, her little fickle heart doesn't really care. And then we find out that Reese did that because her paint was messed up. And had she walked out of that room with her paint messed up without a scene with Reese and, then it would have been known that she was making out with Tamlin. Yes, and, and Amarantha would have been <clears throat> like probably murderously Vivid. angry. <laughs> yes. Yes. So then after that night, we go to the third task. And this task involves her killing three Fae. And she does not like this at all, but she's like, hey, like I kill these three Fae and I can save the rest of them. Or I don't kill these three Fae and all of them die. So I guess this is like the better of the evils going on. So she ends up stabbing the first two. Yeah, these are ash daggers. Yes. And so the first one is a young boy who is begging her not to kill him. And then the second one is a woman who is like, I, I get the sense that she understands the better, like the good for everyone. And so she's just like saying her prayers and like, okay, come on, just kill me, make it fast. And so she does. And then the third one is Tamlin. And she looks back to at Tamlin like by Amarantha and the adder glamours. And so she's like, this isn't fair. And Amarantha's like, oh, fair. Um, and so Tamlin is sitting there and she is going through everything that she's ever heard in her mind. And she's figuring out that she was meant to overhear all of those instances where Tamlin was talking to Lucian or the Adder was talking or whatever. And the Adder had just recently, like she overheard him talking to somebody else and saying that, Amarantha doesn't ever do anything that doesn't benefit her in some way. And so Fair is like, well, it wouldn't benefit her for me to kill Tamlin because she wants Tamlin for herself. So there's something I'm missing in this. And so she starts thinking about all of these moments where she overheard something else. And there was a common thread of your heart is stone to Tamlin. And so she's like, oh, okay. So if I stab him, his heart is stone. So it's not going to like kill him. And so she's like, well, here it goes. And she stabs him and she hits his heart of stone. Doesn't she say that she loves him too, right before she does mm-hmm. it in case like this is it. Yeah. She finally says those yes. words. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so Tamlin doesn't die and she technically wins and all of the Fae are like, she won, she won. And Amarantha's like, well, I didn't say when you guys would be released. I just said I would release you. And she starts like beating Feyre with her magic. And Feyre is about to die. And she remembers that she said immediately with the riddle. So then she's like, okay, think about the riddle. Think about like what this meant. Think about it. Think about it. And she finally figures out that the answer to the riddle is love. And so in her dying breath, She says, the answer to your riddle is love. And she beats her. And so all of the Fae are now free. But Feyre is dead. Like, she is looking on herself through Resand. This is such a graphic scene because she's been thrown against the wall. She's been bashed into the wall. Her neck was snapped. Um, Mm -hmm. Her spine is broken. Like, she is broken. And... I think she's like sobbing too. Like she knows that this is it. Like she's dying. Um, But it's so cool what happens next. So because everyone is free, Tamlin like loses his shit. And then all of the Fae members, all of the High Lords come over and like put like a little glimmer. 
little kernel of their power. their their magic or their being or whatever. And Feyre comes back to life, but isn't she a Fey now? She's a high Fey now. Mm-hmm. She is yeah. changed. She is way different. But that again, it's like that what you said, like a life debt is coming back. They owed her the life of their courts and themselves. And so they gave a little bit of themselves to her. Yeah, it's not all the courts that came and and gave like a kernel of their power, but it's definitely the ones that had banded together against Amarantha and I think Lucian like the was summer one. Court, mm-hmm. The day court. The winter, I think. Yeah. yeah. Talon doesn't, but I think Resand does, doesn't he? I can't remember. I think he's the last I, one. Yeah, he. Right? I think he did. Yeah, he did. But do we want to talk about how <laughs> Tamlin went to town on Amarantha? Because, I mean, Rhysand was right. He would become all-powerful and do it, and it's not pretty whatsoever. <laughs> no, go ahead. There's a, he is given a sword, like, chucks it through her forehead, basically, tears her throat out with his jaws, I think. Like, he does yeah. it with his teeth, right? In animal form. I mean, he just goes straight beast mode on her. And she she dead. And then everybody... She dead dead. She dead dead. There's no... No one's donating a kernel of their power to bring this bitch back to life. So, all of the people that have been kept under the mountain in Amarantha's little realm, they're all free now to go. And so are the people who are in the spring court. So, when we go back to the spring court, we see Alice is free and so are her little wisps of grandchildren or mm-hmm. nephews. Nephews. Yeah, yeah. I I got a very big sense of like Alice was like the teapot in Beauty and the Beast, yes. and like the little kids were Chip, and I'm like, oh, oh Chip's yes, mm-hmm. uh, because I love Chip so much. He was so cute. Uh huh. All the masks come off, and I think they have like. They're recuperating a little bit, like Tamlin and Feyre. So, of course, they have sex under the mountain, another little romantic moment. And Tamlin is still sleeping, and Feyre is woken up. Like, something is, like, coaxing her out of bed. Mm -hmm. So she, you know, in her nighty or whatever, is, like, walking down the corridors, up the stairs, finds herself on a balcony of of the mountain. And who is standing there? And what do they talk about? (laughs) Well, Rhysand's standing there. <laughs> um, but I'm going to let you talk about what they talk about. So Rhysand is standing there, and he obviously looks like he has not been able to sleep. He is thinking hard about something. He's bothered by something. And so the moment between them is very, like, two survivors acknowledging each other, you know, and kind of being grateful for the other. And so he admits to her You know, the reason why he's been helping her is he didn't want her to have to die alone because he has had way too many experiences around that. And so you kind of get this more humanity aspect coming out where you start to appreciate Rizand. Well, and that's exactly what she said about the winged summer court person Uh um, that she stayed with because he was dying. And then you get this very sweet moment right before Reese is like about to walk out and he looks at her like really weird and then leaves. Super weird. And okay, in my mind, (laughs) because Throne of Glass, there are mates. I think that there are mates in this one too. And she is not Tamlin's mate, which is why he was kept up all night. That's that's my theory right now. That look, he just realized, oh, crap, she's my mate. It was like an extreme light bulb moment that he was having. Yes. And wasn't he like sniffing like super hard, yes. like his nostrils Which, were just like. I mean, <laughs> I do enjoy me some paranormal books. And that is always <laughs> what they do when they find their mate is they sniff them. <laughs> They're like, that's how they find them is they smell them, right? They have like this distinct smell to them. And so if they're mates, sniffing, I'm like, if they're mates, do you think it works like Throne of Glass where he's able to sense like her moods and what she's been doing and up to? Well, AKA I mean, wish- he's already able to sense her moods because of his power. Yeah, that's right? the weird thing about the tattoo. Uh huh. Like he can already like sense her because of the tattoo. So, so is he yes. there? Like, My answer is having- yes, because he already can. 
<laughs> so while they're having sexy, right. sexy time, he's just like looking out through the eyeball or something. Well, <laughs> well, in all of my like books, right? And they sense their mate. They can also sense their mate like when they're sleeping with somebody else because it physically hurts them. So like in my head, I'm thinking he was up all night because it was physically hurting him for her to be getting with Tamlin. And he uh-huh. didn't realize why until he smelled her. And he's like, oh, damn it. I just I just handed her to the dude and she's my mate. Well, how convenient that she'll be spending a week of every month with him learning to read, apparently. <laughs> yes. Well, and that that comment, like, okay, so after he saves her in the, that second, like, trial thing, um, which Sarah J. Mass is, like, really down for these trials, right? Like, she mm-hmm. loves putting our heroines in, like, mortal danger. But anyway... Um, after that one, he makes a snide comment about like, ooh, so the like all high and mighty human can't read or something like who would have imagined? And I'm like, you asshole. I know. Mm -hmm. It's like she in her internal dialogue, whenever Tamlin had been like, oh, it's not your shortcoming that you can't read. And then Rizan's just like, oh, you can't even read. And (laughs) yeah. Um, so yeah, I find him funny. And, like, he wants it all for a good reason, but, like, that was just kind of a mean comment. Like, I can't even, like, let him have his gruff, snarky comment when it's just, like, mean. Yes, but here's here's the thing, dear listeners. Tara's man type is the snarky, smartass, mm-hmm. dark, swaggering male. And, mm-hmm. yeah, that has resand all over it for Tara. Um, Again... Go watch the show Lucifer. That is my perfect man. I mean, minus being the, the actual literal devil, but he's still like, yes. All right. That's like three or four mentions of Lucifer that you've had in this episode. I know. You are, I know. You are cut off. <laughs> it's a good There's, thing we're at the end of the episode because. There was, <laughs> there was a quote that Reason said that melted my cold, cold heart. He says, be grateful of your human heart, Feyre. Pity those who don't feel anything at all. And that was one of his parting, like, message before he just kind of, it's like he steps into a portal and just, like, leaves, right? But, but, I mean, I'm just throwing this out here because heart of stone, dude, he has a heart of stone. Like, does he actually have feelings? Like, is he hinting at, like, like, Tamlin, like, feel sorry for Tamlin because he doesn't actually have feelings. I don't know. That's interesting. That's an interesting thought. <laughs> I'm, I'm like reading all into everything. Everybody's saying now. Tara's okay. like, I can't trust any little tiny, the tiniest Nugget. phrase. That's, like yeah. it's going to come back. Mm-hmm. And so Rizan disappears going off, you know, somewhere back to night court, probably. And Tamlin to lick and Feyre. His wounds. Yes. To lick his wounds. And Feyre and Tamlin return to spring court and she calls it going home, which is so sweet to me. Like that's become her happy place and her new, her new home away from home, you know, apart from his sisters. So I also, if anybody knows mythology, there's a myth about Persephone, who is Demeter's daughter. Mm -hmm. She is the like goddess of spring, right? And she is married to Hades, who is obviously very similar to the high lord of the night court right and she gets kidnapped by Hades and like there's like this kind of bargain where she has to spend a certain amount of time in Hades with Hades and the rest of the time she can spend on earth with the spring and that's when we get like the growth of plants is when she's up top and then everything dies in the winter when she goes down south I'm getting a very Persephone Hades vibe off of Resand and um Feyre and a very like up top vibe off of her and Tamlin. For sure. A hundred percent. That's a good call out. Uh, so the next book in the series is called A Court of Mist and Fury. So any theories it's going to happen. I mean, we had our big bad conflict in this book, which was the mysterious she, Amarantha. But there's going to be a bigger bad. A bigger right? Because the King of Highburn. Like, they mention that he is wanting to get the, the human lands back again, right? And that he is planning something. And Amarantha was, like, getting in the way of his plans. And he was getting mad at her. 
So, like, I have a feeling he's going to be a bigger bad throughout the rest yeah. of the books. Yeah, now that she's not there to keep him in check, he might be testing some things. Yeah. Yeah. And so that, and then there's going to be some play at Tamlin and Reese, right? Because they're not going to be happy sharing a woman for long. <laughs> Tamlin, certainly not. <laughs> and and if your theory about Rezand is true. Hail no for him either. <laughs> so uh, there's going to be something happening there. A Court of Miss and Fury is a lot of uh, fans of the series, like their favorite book. Um, well, I don't know. Silver Flames might have changed that for some people, but it's like one of the favorites of the series. So I can't wait until you dive into that. So Hopefully we shall a see. a little bit sooner mm-hmm. before the recording session. Yeah. Uh, Tara able to. finished reading this book like 10 minutes before we started recording. So add a girl. I, I started it yesterday, though. <laughs> um, so it was very quick. Very quick read for me, which again, I missed a lot of things because of, so I do not recommend, but shit happens in life. And yeah, Mist and, um, Mist and Fury is longer. I think it is considerably longer than the first book. So maybe we'll start a little bit earlier on this one. So we're just basically splitting out, you know, the book in half and we will cover the first half of A Court of Thorns and Rose or A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah J. Mass on Monday. So if you need to look up the reading schedule, we have that posted to our Instagram. Our handle is just at Story Darlings. So if you are not subscribed to our podcast, um, we're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you enjoyed our little discussion, like feel free to drop a rating and a review um, wherever you listen. So we appreciate you tuning in, joining the read along. <sighs> Bye. Till next week. <laughs>